As you can see by looking in front of me, there are a lot of expansions for Marvel Champions, and especially as a new player, it could be really confusing on what you're supposed to get, or what you want to get, or what option you want to take. Do you want to get a campaign box, or a scenario pack, or do you want to just get hero packs? In this video, I'll be making a guide to help you figure out which option is best for you. Designing this guide for all kinds of players. Whether you have a background in deck building games and are just brand new to Marvel Champions, or if you've never even played a card game, this video will work for you. Before I get into it though, if you could take a little bit of time to like and subscribe, that would help me out a lot. Thanks. There are a few different purchase options. The first thing you have to get though is the core set. Uh, you need the standard set out of it, and it's a pretty good deal because it comes with five heroes, uh, all the tokens you need, and three villains. The retail on it is $70, but you can find it a lot of different places for cheaper than that, like $40 to $50 is uh, pretty easy to find. And then your next option is going to be campaign boxes. So every campaign box will come with two heroes and five villains, along with a playable campaign. And they're all going to be about $45. Uh, the price hasn't gone down on them as much as the core box has. And then the third main option you're going to do is get uh, hero packs. So a hero pack will just come with one hero deck with uh, called a pre-constructed deck. Uh, so it's not completely optimal, but it gives you all the cards you need to play that hero, and it's a functional deck most of the time. And then also it comes with roughly 12 aspect cards, uh, depending on what hero you get. So core box is required, and then in general, the campaign boxes are going to give you a lot more value uh, than the hero packs. So when you're looking at, do I want a campaign box or a hero pack, uh, in general, the answer is going to be campaign box. Don't let that stop you from, if you just love a hero, get that hero. Because everything in the game is good. Like, there's not anything that I think is poorly designed or anything like that. Uh, so you can you can definitely make your own choices. That brings up that everything I say in here is going to be a guide. And feel free to deviate from this whenever you want. I just wanted to give people a reference point, though, to see where they want to branch, out, branch off. Instead of having it be random. Because I know with when I personally went through buying everything... I didn't do it in the optimal order, and then my my player card suffered for that, and I and I wished I could change some few th a few things. I want to help people avoid what I went through. Now the last option is scenario packs. I didn't add this on the other slide because these are really one offs. They don't really relate to each other, and they're not required for anything. It's more like if you just really want one of these scenarios, or you want a standalone, or a, or a villain that's more interesting and functions a little more complicated or is a bigger expansion than just a normal villain, then this is for you. So at any point, if you want one of these, I'd say go for it. But I want to tell everyone what each of these packs contains so that you're not just going in blind on getting these. The first one that came out was the Green Goblin. This scenario pack is fantastic. It feels like you're fighting the Green Goblin. It comes with two scenarios, not just one. So one is called Risky Business, where you're dealing more with Norman Osborn, and then the other one is classic Green Goblin stuff. Especially if you're going to get a lot of spider characters, I would recommend getting this scenario pack if you wanted one. It's a great way to supplement the core box as well. And the Wrecking Crew is the next one. This is a multi-villain scenario. There's a lot going on in this. Uh, it's really fun, but I would definitely prefer Green Goblin in general over the Wrecking Crew, unless you just really are interested in fighting multiple villains at the same time. Kang the Conqueror is probably my favorite scenario pack because I really enjoy multi multiplayer. So if you have a group of people that you want to play with, I would definitely recommend Kang. Uh, I don't want to spoil it, but it's one of the most fun and unique scenarios in the game. The Hood has a couple things going for him. So he comes with a, what's called Standard Set 2. The Standard 1 that came with this with the core box and then there's, uh, there's standard one and expert. And then the hood comes with standard two and expert two, which is basically the same cards, but they haven't. it's a bit harder. There's additional effects on all of them that make it more difficult to win the game. And the hood's whole deal is that his influence on the scenario is very minimal. He has just a handful of cards that are his own, but then he plays with multiple modular sets at the same time, and then his cards interact uniquely with those modular sets. So if you're someone that really enjoys customizing your experience with modular sets, the hood is a great option. But if you're not, then I would recommend getting waiting waiting till later to get the hood. The Mojo Mania Scenario Pack is also a fantastic option. 
it's unique in the sense that it is actually a mini campaign. So it comes with three villains that are all interrelated, and then it has these modular sets that are also all related to each other. And it's a very immersive experience. It has uh, Magog, Spiral, and Mojo. And if you liked, if you liked the X Men or saw that X Men animated TV show from the '90s, I would definitely recommend this one. Later on, I'll talk about doing spiders or guardians or adventures or, or mutants. So I won't go too too much into Mojo right now. But if you're wanting to play mutants, definitely get Mojo. Now. I can talk about the first campaign box. I'm going to talk about every campaign box in here and go over a little bit about each of the heroes and then rate the campaign box in different categories that will be relevant to you. The first category is going to be difficulty. So the way I'm evaluating this is if you just have the core box and this is the first expansion that you get, how difficult is this going to be? So for Red Skull, I gave it a one and the green started to signify that this is going to be the easiest. The last two villains in the box, Zola and Red Skull, are quite difficult, and I wouldn't say are easier than the other scenarios. They're both pretty difficult villains, but the thing about this box is that the campaign and all the villains are much less complicated than future boxes, so even though the difficulty of the box might be average to slightly below average, the complexity, especially for a new player, is going to be very low compared to the other boxes, making it an easier experience. Next category is going to be villains. So this is going to signify uh, the villains as standalone scenarios because you can play it in campaign mode, but then also you can play the villains as standalone. So how often are you going to replay these villains is how I'm rating this. For Red Skull, I give it three stars because especially if you just got the core box, the first three scenarios are going to be very uh, thematic and go well with the core box, and they're fun. And they're also not too difficult. Uh, the last two, Zola and Red Skull, are going to be something that you do if you're looking for a challenge. It's not going to be something that you just pull out and play all the time, but they're definitely good scenarios. So this is kind of middle of the road as far as this list goes, and the villains are good, but I wouldn't say they're the best villains in the box for replaying them. And now this category is going to be hero strength. For this box, I gave it a three. Uh, Hawkeye is not all that strong. He's a little bit below average, but Spider-Man, but Spider-Woman is pretty strong. So since she is quite good and Hawkeye's okay, uh, I think it's about average strength for a box. And you'll notice that the hero strength is above the difficulty for this campaign, meaning that if you just had these heroes, I don't think you would have a very difficult time getting through the box on standard. So that's another thing to pay attention to with this list is the hero strength compared to the difficulty of the box because that will greatly affect your experience, especially if this is one of the first campaigns you're getting. The next category is how thematic is it? So this is how immersed I felt in the story while I was playing it. And for Red Skull, uh, I gave it two stars. It does It is a cohesive story, and but it's not integrated as well as a lot of the other boxes. And the scenarios do feel kind of separate compared to a lot of the other boxes where the story feels more like a, through, a clear through line. So this is not going to be the box if you're looking for just an immersive experience. And then the final category is going to be replayability. Uh, this is specifically the replayability of the campaign. The campaign mechanics will change the scenarios going forward. So this is basically considering... Is it worth your time to play the campaign mode instead of just playing the villains on their own? And for this box, I gave it two stars. Uh, you get these upgrades throughout the campaign, which are pretty impactful. But again, it's not one of the better campaigns at doing this. So I don't see much benefit in playing the campaign mode over the standalone scenarios for this box specifically. Now that all of the categories have been introduced, I'll go over this for each of the boxes. The next release was the Guardians box. It came with Rocket and Groot which are two of my favorite heroes uh, thematically. And the difficulty of this box is five stars. I made it red because it's definitely the hardest box, especially if you don't have a larger card pool before going into it. The villains on their own, I gave two stars because the difficulty of this box makes it to where you're going to go to the villains in this box when you're looking for a challenge. And it's going to be more of like a, a commitment to defeating a challenge more so than just sitting down to play Marvel Champions. Drang is not all that difficult of a scenario, but then and Collector 2 is not all that difficult. The Collector 2 is still pretty difficult, but then the rest of the villains in the box are going to be very difficult to deal with 
especially if you're not playing a hero or a deck that's built specifically to beat those scenarios. And then what makes this box harder is that the hero strength on this box, in my opinion and my experience at least, was one of the was the lowest of out of all the heroes. So Rocket and Groot are very interesting in how they work. You can see that Rocket wants to deal excess damage, uh, and then he gets to draw cards, and then he has all these weapon upgrades that uh, interact with his kit in a, a very complicated way. And then he he wants to use his Tinker ability on the alter ego side to draw cards and get new weapons. But flipping strategies are very difficult to implement, especially if you don't have a large card pool to facilitate that. And then Groot, his whole thing is that he gets these growth counters that block damage. But one of the difficult things, especially if you're trying to go through this box with Groot, is that the villains in this box, uh, Ronin in particular, hit very, very hard. And with just the core box and the Guardians expansion, it's going to be extremely difficult to beat the campaign with Rocket and Group. Uh, I'm not sure if it's possible. Like, it might be possible with just the precons, but if you if you did, it would be, be extraordinarily difficult. And even if you edit your decks heavily, but don't have that many cards, it's still going to be incredibly difficult. This is definitely the hardest box. Uh, but also, it's one of the most thematic boxes. So the whole time you're going through this, you have the Milano ship, which interacts with all of the uh, scenarios in a unique way. And it really feels like you're in space, and it feels like you're the Guardians of the Galaxy. And the campaign mechanic is really immersive, so you get these credits through the campaign that then let you purchase campaign upgrades that you can take with throughout the game with you. And you can choose how you want to do that. You can save it. You can save up your credits, or you can get smaller upgrades. And it's an extremely immersive experience, which it's. I don't want to try to detract from the campaign because a lot of people are just really down on it entirely, which I don't think that's exactly right uh, because there are really great things about this box. It's just if you're not prepared for this box, it's it can kind of ruin the experience for you. And then the replayability is also very good. Like as a that uh, the market, as I was talking about, is extremely replayable because you're never going to get all of the upgrades and there's always going to be different choices for you to get the only reason i didn't put it higher is that a lot of the immersion and replayability comes from the milano uh that's the ship support that you get but that's still that immersive in the standalone scenarios so the only extra thing really is uh some stuff during setup and the um the credits that you get to buy upgrades which is really cool, but I don't think it's one of the best mechanics in all the boxes. So then came the Infinity Gauntlet campaign. It's called the Mad Titan's Shadow. This was actually the very first campaign I got. It comes with Adam Warlock and Spectrum, which are both pretty involved heroes. Adam Warlock is a mystic, and we'll get into mystics later, but his, mechanic, his mechanics in the game are unique and different. So you can see that he, when he builds his deck, uh, he actually builds it with all four aspects and has to include an equal number of each which is a creative deck deck building uh challenge but i'm not i'm not sure that's not really for everyone i came from a background of playing uh card games that were like Yu Gi Oh and magic the gathering so i was already familiar with deck building games and i really enjoyed uh adam warlock's deck building but if you're not already used to deck building or if that's not your favorite thing about marvel champions uh he can be just kind of uh too much like more than you'd want to deal with and then spectrum uh has these energy forms which she gets different bonuses depending on which one you're in it's kind of difficult to manage uh which ener energy form you're in so it's also di uh, kind of difficult for a beginner player but both of these heroes are really interesting and they have cool mechanics now getting onto the box the difficulty of this it's fine it's not too difficult it's not too hard it's like right in the middle uh, Ebony Ma is uh, probably a medium villain. He can be difficult sometimes. He can be easy sometimes. Uh, Tower Defense, which is the next one, is one of the easiest scenarios in the campaign, or in Marvel Champions, in my experience at least. Uh, then uh, the other villains, so you're going to have Thanos and Loki and Hela. Uh, Thanos and Loki are very difficult, uh, more, so on the higher side of difficulty. And Hela is feels almost like a campaign or like a scenario pack expansion. She's not necessarily the most difficult, but there's definitely a lot of thinking you have to do to defeat her. And now onto the villains. Uh, 
yeah, four stars for them. I would definitely replay basically all of these villains except for uh, Loki. Uh, Loki is another one of those villains where it feels like you have to be in the mood to play him. A lot of people just straight up don't like Loki. I do like Loki, but I totally understand why people don't. Um, that'll be a theme throughout this box is that the final villain is not in general for all these boxes isn't something that you're going to play all the time. You're going to have to be in the mood for it because they're difficult villains. And then the hero strength, I give it three here, which Adam Warlock is, um, I don't know, he's very interesting. And there's a lot of decks out there that you can try that will increase his strength a lot. But both of these are really hard to play. Uh, and that's sort of what limits them for, especially if this is your first box. Like I was nowhere near playing either of these characters to their max strength when I got this expansion as my first one. But it wasn't horrible either. I was able to get through the campaign. And I, but I also had to learn how to deck build to do that. So it will be a little bit difficult to get through it if you don't try to mess with the decks at all. But it's not too bad. And then this was also a very thematic campaign. So there's different... Uh, the, the way you play each scenario is going to affect the no next scenario. So instead of just getting like an external thing, uh, like a boon that helps you get through the campaign, this is... a uh, all of the campaign mechanics are directly integrated into the scenarios in a way that's unique and very fun and very replayable. And I had a great time with it. And then for the replayability, definitely worth it. It's very thematic and you'll get a different experience every time in the campaign mode. So now on to Sinister Motives. It comes with Spider-Man and uh, or Spider -Man Miles Morales and Ghost Spider. Ghost Spider's whole thing is that she has a lot of responses, so you're playing mostly on the villain phase, which is very new. There's not very many heroes like that can do that, and I think she's the best one at doing that. After, as you can see, after you resolve an interrupt or response, you get to ready her, and a lot of protection cards and her cards are interrupt and responses, so you get to block for the whole table if you want, and you'll basically play entirely on the villain phase, villain phase which is unique. And uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales has these two specials on his card. So he can deal two damage and stun an enemy, or he can get a tough status card and confuse an enemy. And these status cards can be incredibly powerful. But he does get kind of countered by uh, Stalwart and Steady. Like, he can still play, but it's just much harder for him. But So against easy scenarios, Miles is going to just stomp, and it'll be a breeze. You won't have to even think about it, really as long as you're stunning and confusing and getting the tough status cards. But then against steady villains, it's going to be a whole different experience. Uh, these are two of my favorite heroes. Okay, and then going on, the difficulty of this campaign uh, on standard, I don't think is that, that bad. It's definitely difficult, but it's not too hard. Uh, the expert version is a completely different experience, and I would recommend playing it on expert, but that's not really what this video is about, so I'll save that to, for a future video. And the villains in here are also thematic. You can see the box. You got like the whole Sinister Six and Venom. Uh, the final villain isn't on the box, but all of these villains are so spider themed and it really immerses you in the spider world and they all have interesting mechanics. And if you had just the core box and Sinister Motives, you'd definitely be replaying, the, replaying these villains all the time, except for uh, maybe the last one, which is Venom Goblin. So then the hero strength, I gave this one five. And in my opinion, this is going to be the strongest two heroes that you can get as your first expansion. So some of the other heroes that come later on uh, could be, or can, can definitely be stronger than these two. But with just the core box and Sinister Motives, I think these are the strongest decks you're going to be able to make is for Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Ghost Spider. And then the thematics. This is also five stars. This is the most thematic campaign, in my opinion. Uh, the campaign mechanic is integrated extremely well. Uh, there's this reputation track. So you have, like, J. Jonah Jameson trying to, like, slander you in the news, uh, saying a bunch of lies about you, and then up creating a public outcry, which is actually an environment in there uh, that you have to try to defeat minions and side schemes to get rid of. So when you help the citizens, they start turning back to your side but then the whole time J. Jonah Jameson is trying to turn them against you and that's, that's an interesting push and pull throughout the game and then also on top of that there's the shield mechanic so 
the shield, as you do well, as you save more citizens, as you defeat more side schemes, will start noticing that, hey, this player's pretty good. They're doing a lot of stuff. And then they'll help you out. Uh, you get more upgrades. You get uh, extra mulligans. You get to grab cards from your collection. It's it's incredibly varied. Uh, like, you have a lot of options in there. But then as you get stronger and S.H.I.E.L.D. starts taking note of you, the villains also start getting stronger because then they start preparing for you because they're like, whoa, th they're making kind of a lot of noise out here. We got to prepare for them. And then they get better at taking you down as well. So if you're struggling, it's not going to get harder. But if you're doing well, you'll get stronger, but then also the villains will get stronger. So it's a, it's an incredibly fun experience. And that's also why I gave it a five on replayability because it's going to be so different every time you play it. And depending on the heroes you get, because there's a lot going on with the campaign. And then also the villains are fantastic. And then the campaign changes how the villains work a lot. So Sandman uh, will like flood the city streets, but in, in the campaign, it changes how that works a bit. Mysterio changes how that works a bit. And then if you don't defeat Mysterio very well, uh, he creates a lot of illusions that distract you in in the Sinister Six battle. So each of these is very connected to each other, and the campaign is a fully different experience than the standalones, but the standalones are also good. So that's why this box I rated so highly. And then on to X-Men. So this comes with Shadowcat and Colossus. Shadowcat is a form-changing hero, uh, similar to Spectrum. Uh, she's most similar to Vision, which is a hero pack, but she gets to go like intangible and tangible. And her she's kind of difficult to play but she has a lot of interactions that you can do and then colossus's whole thing is that he gets additional tough status cards so not you, you can have not only one but two tough status cards on colossus and then so you can either keep them and then not take any damage for a very long time or you can spend them to get bonus effects on his cards again he's also pretty hard to play both of these are pretty hard to play and then going into the difficulty i rated this a four uh one because it's very difficult like the first scenario Sabretooth, is i've i've personally struggled with him the most out of the entire box it's so like magneto is the final boss but I've, I've i don't think i've even lost to magneto yet uh but Sabretooth, when i first tried to play it with shadow cat and colossus on the precon decks i lost like four times in a row and this was well into when i started playing uh, Sabretooth is one of the most difficult villains in my opinion and then also in campaign mode he's even more difficult uh, and also the complexity as a new player there's going to be a lot going on and these are both complicated heroes and the scenarios are getting more complicated and it'll be very difficult if you if you're just jumping straight into this so this brings up something interesting there's there's not really power creep in the game like all the old heroes are generally just as strong as the new heroes but there is complexity creep which I think will affect a new player. So now onto the villains. Uh, they are extremely replayable though. Uh, it has some of my favorite scenarios in the game. Like I don't go back to Sabretooth all that much just because he's so uh, difficult and he heals so much and it's like a very long drawn out battle to, to get him. So, and then, so for this one, there's the final boss and the first villain of the box are both scenarios that are... Uh, feel like a final boss to me but then mansion attack is one of my favorite scenarios in the entire game it's uh incredibly replayable because uh your your the x mansion is getting attacked by the brotherhood and then there's different different schemes out so you're going to have different brotherhood uh villains and different schemes out that affect uh the whole map so it creates a varied experience every time you play it it's a great time and then the hero strength, I put it at a three because I think both of these heroes uh, need a lot of cards to like fully maximize how strong they are. And also, I don't think a new player would be able to pilot these player these heroes correctly. They're two of the hardest to play uh, heroes in the game, in my opinion. They're they're very difficult to play, uh, but they are also strong. But the problem is that the villains the villains in this are also very strong. So you're gonna be kind of undermatched that's why i edit in orange stars because in my opinion uh the heroes here with mutant genesis and the core box are going to get outmatched by the villains which can be difficult for a new player especially and then the thematics this campaign 
the story of it is incredibly thematic. Um, the, uh, the mutants are uh, trying to deal with Robert Kelly and uh, help their public perception. But at the same time, uh, the Sentinel program's underway. So you have to deal with, it really does feel like you have to deal with trying, like being an X-Men and you have to try to stop uh, the mutants that are upset about all the discrimination they're going through, like the Brotherhood, like they're taking like a retaliatory approach that's hurting their cause. And you're kind of just like against everyone. And it really, it really immerses you in the X-Men world in an interesting way. But the replayability of the campaign because of the campaign mechanic, I think is probably the least, the least compelling to me. You get this class that lets you add like an extra aspect card to your deck and you get an upgrade. It's very similar to the Red Skull campaign, but then much later on and the Red Skull upgrades felt more impactful when I had them. And out of all the campaigns, I probably would replay the campaign mode of this one uh, the least out of all the boxes. But that's not because that's not saying that it's not thematic or the villains aren't good. It's just the campaign mechanic specifically fell a little flat for me on this one. And now on to next evolution. So this is the second uh, X Men campaign. It came with Domino and Cable, two very interesting heroes. Uh, Domino's whole thing is that she's really lucky, and then to represent that, uh, you get to kind of stack your deck, and then she discards cards from the top. And if you count a wild resource, you get to count it twice to get bonus effects on the cards. So you can like organize your deck to how you want it uh which simulates how it feels to be lucky and be domino and just have everything work out but it's also very very difficult domino might be the most difficult to play hero in the in the whole game there's a lot of comp complexity going on there uh and then cable also one of the more complex villains so this box actually introduces an entire new mechanic called a player side scheme and cable is like going through the time stream right so he has all these ulterior motives that he's trying to accomplish to help his time stream and that's represented by his um side scheme in his kit and then when you defeat those player side schemes uh it helps the players so you play it from your hand it comes out it counts as a side scheme and then you can defeat it to get a bonus and that mechanic is really interesting and cable plays off that a lot um so now going into the difficulty this box is definitely a lot less difficult than the first mutant box uh juggernaut is kind of difficult and um and the strife can be kind of difficult but other than that it's not really all that difficult of a box like the the villains are like average to below average in difficulty the whole time and but they are very fun villains so like the first two scenarios use this uh use all these marauder villains which are villains which is like a whole stack of them and they interact with the uh, game very different. So you're going to get different villains every time you play through this, which makes it those two scenarios very replayable. Uh, and then Juggernaut is incredibly cool. There's the, the whole moment, momentum counter stuff where he really feels unstoppable and you have to try to deal with that. And he has his helmet, so you can try to pop his helmet off and then he's more vulnerable. And you try to not let him get momentum, and that's really cool. Since the uh, Mr. Sinister... Uh, is absorbing all these different superpowers. So he, playing him is going to be different every time as well. So this is just, the villains in this box are really solid. They're not my favorite villains out of all the boxes, but they're definitely up there. And then the hero strength, I gave four stars. So Domino and Cable are both incredibly strong. Uh, and if they're built correctly, I think they're stronger than Miles and Gwen are. But the thing is, is that you're not really going to be able to build them correctly with just uh, just this. So if you jump in, I think they'll be functional. Like you'll be able to get through it with like either their pre-constructed decks or a slightly edited one, but you're not gonna maximize these heroes. One, because they're really complex and two, because you won't have the cards to do that yet. And then the thematics of this campaign, uh, I, it wasn't as high on the thematics list. The, so you're, um, you're basically trying to save Hope, which is uh, Cable's daughter. And she integrates with the campaign in an interesting way. Uh, but it's not its not one of my... It doesn't feel the most thematic to me. It feels less thematic to me than the uh, first X-Men box. And less so than Guardians of the Galaxy. But it's not bad on the thematics. It's just a little below average for these boxes. Which I think this is a great game. So below average for a great game is still a good experience. 
And then the replayability of this campaign, I put that at sort of average because there's going to be these side schemes that you defeat and then you're going to get upgrades that help you a lot and it feels a little different than the other times you get upgrades because uh, you have to do something to get those that's like integrated into the scenario, which I find it to be a bit more fun. And then this is the newest expansion, uh, the Age of Apocalypse. So this is a continuation of the storyline. The X-Men tell like a continuous story throughout and it comes with uh, magic and bishop. So magic is a mystic, which is pretty cool. We'll talk more about the mystics later, but magic gets to play with the top card of the deck face up. And then you get to reduce the cost. Once per turn, you can reduce, or sorry, not once per turn, once per phase, you can reduce the cost of it by one. So, and she also gets different bonuses depending on what resources are on top. And that can be a lot of fun to play. Bishop's whole thing is that he has a lot of resources available to him. And then after he takes damage, he can discard cards from the top of his deck and then grab those resources back into his hand. So he's incredibly rich. And then he can spend those resources on this upgrade that lets you store up a big blast so it feels like you're absorbing energy. And then you're going to one-shot the villain with their own strength. And that's really cool. Uh, and his rifle and his suit integrate really well into his kit. Both of these heroes are really good, but they're also quite complicated. So in the difficulty of this box, I put it as a 4. Um, it's not necessarily the most difficult box, but playing through this box, it was one of the the scenarios in it and the setup is one of the most complicated that you're going to see. And this can be an entire rules mess, especially if you're a new player. Cause like I've played through every other box before I got to this one. And I was still having to like really think hard about the rules, which I would not recommend for a new player. Also, uh, having it be the end of a big story arc is, um, not, I don't think the best idea. And then the villains though were fantastic. So, Every villain in this scenario was really fun to play and they had their own special thing going on and are really replayable on their own. And the reason I gave this five stars instead of four is because the final boss of this, uh, Apocalypse, he's um, incredibly fun, but he doesn't feel so overwhelming in the sense that you have to prepare to fight him. I feel like I could actually sit down and play this final villain without having to be in the mood to play a final vi villain but he also still feels like a final villain. So I that's why I gave the villains the edge on this one for this box. And then the hero strength is a four. These are incredibly strong heroes, but again, because they're so complicated, uh, they're gonna be hard to maximize their strength. And the thematics, very thematic campaign. Uh, it really felt like the whole world was crumbling around you. And, and I felt very immersed in the X-Men world, but in a different way than the first one. So the first campaign with the X-Men, it felt like you were immersed in like being a mutant. And this one feels like you're immersed in the whole world collapsing, which was really cool to play through. And then the replayability of it, I give it a three. Note though, I am I, the campaign mechanic for this, I like more than the general, than the general audience of the game. Uh, there's these side missions that go into play. We essentially have to send an ally on a mission to go try to deal with something that's happening somewhere else in the world. And it's very separate from what's going on in your scenario, but also it plays really well into the theme, in my opinion, of it's not just what you're dealing with. The whole world is dealing with this apocalypse. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people don't really like that from what I've heard, but I really like that. So I kind of averaged that out to a three. But also note, this is a very complicated box on the rules. And the mission side schemes are an extra layer of complication when you're trying to play through the campaign, which that can be hard for a new player. So for your first purchase, this is what I would recommend. Obviously, you have to get the core box because that's required to play. And then I would also recommend sleeves. These ones from Gamegenic are nice. I got the clear ones. Uh, I wish I had got the map because they shuffle better and they're only like a dollar more for the packs of 200 which I think is worth it because they'll last longer and they feel better. And then in addition to the core box, I would get Captain America or Doctor Strange. The problem with this is that these are two very powerful and old heroes and they are out of print now. So if you can find a good deal on them, you should definitely grab them. The reason I think you should get them is because when you first start out playing the core box, generally the experience is gonna be uh, in two, player, two and three player, Rhino will be okay, Claw will be pretty hard, and then Ultron will feel impossible. And that, that's, how, that's how it felt for me, at least. 
I got Doctor Strange because I really wanted to be Ultron. And he definitely helped with that because he's so strong. It, especially if you're a beginner and you're just starting out, you want a strong hero because then you can actually experience the game instead of just getting your getting your butt kicked by Claw's minions and Ultron's drones. Captain America also just a very has a very good matchup against Ultron, and he's very beginner friendly. Uh, you can just discard a card to ready, and which since he has a two 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 stat line, that means every turn you're guaranteed at least four damage or four thwart, and then he has three defense with his shield and retaliate which can just help with a lot of things. Very strong. So then, after you get this, I recommend that you choose a class. So think of it like you're building a D&D character, pretty much. I have made some pre-made builds for you. You can deviate if you want, but I think these are all very good ideas. And then you can start here and then supplement them with your own taste. So the first one is the MCU. The second class is Web Warriors. The third, Mutant. And then finally, the Tinker. So the Tinker is, if you're really into deck building, uh, I can offer you a bunch of advice on certain packs to get so that you can build strong decks without having to invest too much money. So MCU, phase one. Hopefully you got the Captain America pack. And these are some of the key cards that he comes with. One, Squirrel Girl. After she enters play, Get to deal one damage to each enemy so again an even better matchup against ultron who's going to be a main who's going to be the big problem for you in the core set then avengers towers of support you can increase your ally limit by one of each of your allies as an avenger and then also you get to exhaust it to reduce the cost of the next avenger ally played so this is setting up an avengers leadership build that you can lean into later on Honorary Avenger is a pretty cool card. You can attach it to a friendly character and then they become an Avenger with plus one hit point. So you can turn allies that aren't Avengers into people that into allies that are Avengers or even other heroes. So as long as your character has the Avenger trait, you can attach that to any character. So, or you can give it to like another player who's like maybe playing a web warrior or something. Then they're also Avengers. So that can be pretty fun. And then uh, Aven- Quinjet is a support it says that for you your turn begins place one time counter on quinjet and then the action is you can put an avenger ally from your hand into play with the printed cost equal to or less than the number of counters on quinjet and then discard quinjet so basically you'll put it out for one cost and then over time it'll pay off to get you an expensive ally for free pretty much and then avengers assemble is max one per round you get to ready each avenger character you control until the end of the phase, each adventure character gets plus one thwart, plus one attack. It's also important to know that that also includes your hero. So this is really good for making final pushes. So you can actually take out the villains before they take you out. And then for phase two, I would recommend just getting the Red Skull campaign. So I went over this earlier, but the Red Skull is a great choice for your first expansion. Also, it's very thematic. Uh, it works well with Captain America. And you're going to get access to these cards. So you'll get team training, which is a leadership card. Each ally will get plus one hit point. And plus one hit point means they also get an extra activation. So also two allies that come with this, or three actually that come with this that are pretty good for you will be Black Knight. Uh, It comes in with piercing, so it goes right right through tough status cards. Goliath is a really fun character to pair up with things like Make the Call, because you give them plus four attack. So he'll have five attack, and then he'll die to consequential damage. Then you can make the call, bring him back, he'll still have the plus 5 attack, so that's 10 damage right there in one turn from an ally. Earth's Mightiest Heroes lets you ready another adventure character you control by exhausting one. So for instance, you could exhaust Black Knight to ready up Captain America. And War Machine is a basic ally, so you can include it in any deck. He's Avengers and Shield, and he has toughness and range, so that's pretty cool. So this is building out the Avengers leadership tree, which is something we want to lean into. And for phase three i recommend just going straight you skip guardians go straight into the mad titan's shadow campaign uh this gives you access to spectrum who comes with even more avengers leadership cards so the captain america ally is pretty cool like he has six costs which is crazy right but then he's tough and then every uh every avenger character you control reduces his cost by one so once you spam avengers out you have like two or three avengers allies suddenly he's not so expensive and then white tiger is great especially on expert mode if you want to try that because you get when she comes into play you get to draw cards uh equal to the villain's stage number so on stage two uh you'll draw two and on stage three you'll draw three so if you're playing a ally that costs three with two thwart two attack 
that can then draw you three cards is is crazy good a, a great card and then mighty avengers place under your control or place under any player's control and then if each of the avenger each of the characters you control has the avengers trait each ally you control gets plus one for it plus one attack so you can see how you're building up a building up a bunch of cards that are going to synergize together mass attack exhaust three allies you control to share a trait with your hero deal x damage to an enemy or execute the total attack of all those allies in your hero so your, your allies take consequential damage when you attack but then you can use mass attack you get a big burst of damage and then also you don't have to deal damage to your characters so then they'll get another activation so that's pretty good as well and also the mad titan's shadow campaign follows along the track of the mcu which i think is really fun because you can start out with like the core box you go into ultron which is like what happened in the uh in the avengers movies uh this is like the side campaign with red skull and what he's doing on and then you and then you go into thanos i think that's just really fun so then for phase four you get mystics so adam warlock comes with the mad titan's shadow and he's really interesting i talked a little bit about his thing earlier but what's really important is that he comes with these cards so these are all uh, locked to mystic characters. So only characters with a mystic trait can play this. And you're only allowed to have one. So magic attack, one cost event. You can discard five cards from your deck. And then deal five damage to an enemy. The zone of silence is a similar idea. You get to, you get to choose a scheme, discard four cards from the top of your deck, and then remove four threat from a scheme. And then summoning spell, you discard off the top of the deck until you get an ally, which if you add in allies like this, that'll be really strong because then you can get a really good ally uh, for not that much. And then shield spell is cool because like let's some of the villains can hit for like, like especially Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet, he can hit you for like 10 pretty frequently. So then with shield spell... Uh, when you would take any amount of damage, you can just discard that many cards off the top of your deck and then prevent all of that damage. So these are really interesting cards that Mystics have access to. And also Kalu. This is an Avengers ally that's also Mystic. And Kalu just searches for your events. So you get to search to the top five cards of your deck for an event and add that to your hand, shuffle your deck. That's good for basically any character because almost every character has events that they really want to play. So picture like you're playing Spider-Man, Peter Parker, um, and then you play Kalu, and then he finds a swinging web kick for you, and then, then you can just win the game off of that. And then hopefully you would you were able to find Doctor Strange because Doctor Strange is absolutely crazy with how strong he is. Uh, this deserves its own video, but he has this invocation deck which is always available to him. He doesn't get to choose what card is on top of it, but every card is crazy. So here's two examples. One cost event, give up to three characters a tough status card. So for one cost, and remember this isn't even in his hand, so it's actually one cost. So it's actually cheaper than a card that's in your hand that's one cost. And for that very small price, you get to give three characters a tough status card that that's crazy you, you block three full villain attacks with just one card and then another one winds of the tomb draw three cards place this card in your, the invocation deck discard pile at zero cost you just and it's not even in your hand so it doesn't even leave your hand you just get three more cards and then he has this other thing master of the mystic arts so he can pay the printed cost of the top of the card of the invocation deck resolve it put it back on top so what you can do with that is you can use master of the mystic arts to pay for winds of the tomb draw three cards and then play Winds of the Tomb again. So you draw six cards in one turn. Uh, absolutely crazy that that's there. Uh, I'm going to go over Doctor Strange in another video later on. But also important to note is that he comes with amazing cards as well. So the Sorcerer Supreme, you only play if you have the Mystic trait. So And it gives you plus one hand size and hero. So that means that Doctor Strange and Adam Warlock will both be able to have six cards in hero. Increases their economy a lot. And also he kind of makes protection viable. Brother Voodoo is essentially the same card as Kalu. Uh, you search the top five cards of your deck for an event card and add it to your hand, shuffle your deck. Uh, but he's just in the protection aspect. Uh, Iron Fist is one of my favorite allies. Uh, the two Mystic counters start on Iron Fist, and then when Iron Fist attacks, you remove one of, one Mystic counter and then stun that enemy and deal damage to it. So it's three damage every attack with a stun, and you can do that twice. So you can stun twice and then block. But that, that that's amazing value of an ally. 
The Night Nurse can heal you one, but also discard a status card, which discarding a status card, I'm sure, like, if when you play enough Marvel Champions, you'll lose to being confused and stunned at some point. And Night Nurse is great at mitigating that. Desperate Defense is really fun because uh, when you uh, defend against an attack, you can get plus two. And if you take no damage, you get to ready your hero. So this enables something called a perfect protection build. So imagine playing Spider-Man Peter Parker. You have three defense and multiplayer. You can block for yourself and then ready and then block for someone else. And there's, there's other ways to ready as well. So essentially you can just start blocking for the whole table and then you really feel like you're protecting the whole table. So Doctor Strange, super powerful, uh, works with the Mystic Synergy with Adam Warlock and then also makes protection a very viable aspect for you. Hopefully, you can find him. Again, he's hard to find, but if you ever do, definitely get him. And now, the next thing to finish off Mystics is Scarlet Witch, the Chaos Sorcerer. So the key card that you'll get with Scarlet Witch is Spiritual Meditation. You get to draw two cards, choose and discard one from your hand. So you can basically just increase the quality of the cards that are in your hand, and only Mystics can do that. So when you have her... Uh, you basically have the Mystic Patrick package complete until uh, Magic comes out, which is like not until very recently in the third X-Men box, which so essentially you can think of Mystics as complete at this point. So these three heroes, uh, they'll have, when you have all of them, they'll basically be full strength because you have all the Mystic support for them. And I highly recommend that because it's incredibly fun. Recap, with the MCU track, what you'll end up with is one campaign and you'll have hawkeye spider woman you'll get captain america and then go into the mad titan's shadow so then after that you get two mystics and here's what you get for that you get the cost of two campaigns and three hero packs you'll end up with 12 heroes to play 13 villains to play and a functional avengers strategy mystic strategy protection strategy and access to just very strong heroes so then you can start playing expert as well and I really wish I had done it in this order because when I went back and I got, or when I did it, I got the Mad Titan's Shadow first. So then the Spectrum deck that came, the Spectrum leadership deck that came was very lackluster because I didn't have any of the leadership support from Captain America and the Red Skull campaign, which makes that the Avenger strategy a lot stronger. Now for the mutant class. I recommend that you actually start with Next Evolution. Uh, Domino and Cable are really fun. But also, this introduces you to an entire new card type called Player Side Schemes, which can fundamentally change the options you have for deck building. And based off what I was saying in the campaign review section, uh, this will be an easier jumping in point because the heroes are strong and the campaign's a bit easier. And I think the first mutant campaign will just be a bit too hard uh, for the very first thing you do. And then after you get the campaign, I suggest just get your favorite mutant. Whatever mutant that is, get that mutant. So for instance, it could be Rogue or Deadpool. Here is my recommendation though. If you don't have a for sure favorite mutant, I'd say just get Wolverine. Because Wolverine is really cool. And then also he's going to give you access to these three cards. Uh, Psylocke is one of the best allies in the game. Uh, an aggression ally that gives you the option to confuse is incredible because then it gives aggression a way to mitigate uh, the main scheme, which is something that can be very lacking uh, and if you just have the corset. Sunfire is another control card that you get. After Sunfire enters play, if you, can, if you spend an energy resource, you can discard an attachment, which if you've ever played Ultron, you'll know that those attachments can be brutal. So Sunfire can just get rid of them. Incredibly strong effect and a great ally. Two, co two costs for two attack and two health is fine. And then with that ability to get you out of some really tight situations, he can go into a lot of good decks. And Colossus is a basic ally. Uh, meaning that anyone can play him pretty much, but he has the additional cost of reducing, the, or the additional effect of reducing his cost by one if you're a mutant or an X-Men. So he's not technically trait locked to X-Men, but he he becomes a three cost ally with three attack and a tough status card. You're going to want to play him very strong, helping you out if you have a small uh, collection of mutants, especially. Now, phase two of the X-Men class. I recommend at this point, you jump into Mutant Genesis. Part of the reason that I say start with Next Evolution is because I feel like it's much more immersive to have five villains available to you instead of just grabbing an X-Men pack and then not playing any X-Men villains. So then at this point, uh, you have 
one campaign, you have two pretty strong heroes, you have one X-Men, um, one or two, you could get as many X-Men as you want, the packs are really good, then you have an X-Men pack along with these two heroes, and you will have had more experience with the game, making this campaign more manageable for you. And also you got some pretty strong cards that can help make Shadow Cat and Colossus able to deal with this campaign. So important cards that come with this box are the X-Jet, Professor X, and X-Mansion. These cards are essential for the X-Men strategy to work. The Wild Resource Generator uh, can is good for basically every, every single X-Men character. Professor X, you don't even have to be an X-Men to use him. Uh, most people just play him because he's three costs. He can come in, confuse the villain, thwart three, and then block. That's amazing. And then if you're an X-Men, you have an additional option to ready an X-Men character. So then you have the choice to ready. So like if you're Wolverine and you're trying to do a rush strategy, Professor, Professor X can thwart for you, help you deal with the scheme, and then also ready Wolverine to get more burst damage. X-Mansion is a pretty fun support. Alter Ego action. You can heal one damage from a mutant or X-Men character. Any player who has the alter, an Alter Ego who has the mutant trait may trigger this. So if you play that and you're in a multiplayer and you're playing with other people that are playing X-Men or mutants, anyone can grab that. So suddenly it's a support for the entire board. That's kind of a theme of X-Men. They're like a cohesive unit, whereas the Avengers are kind of like selfish and like bickery. But the X-Men like live together, they train together, they're more cohesive. So these supports work for anyone. The X-Jet also just says generate a resource for a player whose identity has the X-Men trait. So you can, the, the other X-Men players at the table can share that with you. Whereas the Quinn carrier, which is the Avengers one, isn't like that. It's only works for yourself. So there are multiple paths you can take here with the X-Men. It's not like the Avengers where it feels like if you don't get certain packs, then you're missing out. With the mutants, you really could go the campaign route or the pack route and be fine because a lot of the cards are sprinkled out throughout. Like more characters have good cards and then more care and also the, the good cards are sprinkled around. You really don't have to go a certain way. But here's some recommendations when you're buying packs. Uh, I would recommend if you're getting Phoenix, get Psylocke at the same time because you're going to want access to the psionic cards. Uh, Phoenix is kind of lackluster before you get the full psionic package. And then in, and then one of my favorite heroes in the game once you do get the psionic package. And then also if you're going to do X-Men leadership, get Cyclops and Storm at the same time. Cyclops is unique in that he can include X-Men from any aspect. He's sort of like Adam Warlock, but for allies. And then Storm comes with leadership, but then both Storm and Cyclops kind of feel lackluster if you don't have the other one. Recap on mutants. I'd say start with next evolution. And then from there, just choose a path. You could go packs, but make sure you get Phoenix and Psylocke together and Cyclops and Storm together. Or you could just go linearly through the linearly through the campaigns at that point, just get mutant genesis and then go into apocalypse. Or get packs. So the Deadpool pack in particular is pretty good. I'll talk about that later. So if you pick the web warrior trait, definitely start with sinister motives. I talked about these a little bit before. Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Ghost Spider are two of the best heroes, best campaign in my opinion as well, and you get a lot for it. First, you get the Web Warrior trait, which is arguably the strongest trait, in the game, and it's one of the most fun. So this three cost support, Web of Life and Destiny, is a location. You get to ignore the card's cost if your identity has the Web Warrior trait, so it's just free for you. And the response is, after Web Warrior ally leaves play, choose a player, and that player draws one card. So notice it says choose a player. It could be any player on the table. It will often be yourself, but you could also do it for someone else if they needed a card. Across the Spider-Verse action, you can exhaust a Web Warrior card you control, and you search your discard pile for a Web Warrior ally and put it into play, then choose a player. That player may, may spend three resources of any type to repeat this ability. Uh, Spider-Man Peter Parker is a fantastic choice for the across the Spider-Verse. Notice he has a requirement energy mental and physical must be used when paying for him and his response is after spider-man attacks or thwarts choose another web warrior character and ready that character so you'll get to ready your hero or another ally every time you use spider-man i think it's best to ready your hero so you like attack with ghost spider for two attack with spider-man peter parker for two ready ghost spider attack with ghost spider for two that can be really useful and this is a very synergistic trait and Again, it's one of the most fun, and it's one of the strongest, and you don't need that much to complete it. So then, not only do you get the Web Warrior trait, you also get Shield. So 
Spider-Man Miles Morales comes with these cards that are that are pretty good. Also, there's a lot more uh, shield cards. I'm just including these three because they're three of my favorite. So Monica Chang says, after Monica Chang enters play, search your deck, hand, and discard pile for a copy of the surveillance team support and put it into play and place one snoop counter on each surveillance team you control. So an ally that comes in, Monica can thwart one or attack for one and plays a two cost support uh, for free and then adds an extra counter, brings it up to four. That's crazy. And also, if you already have two surveillance teams out, it goes on each. So if you have two surveillance teams, you play Monica, you get your third one out, and then you place three more counters. So that with your surveillance teams out, uh, three of them with four counters, that can thwart 12. Suddenly, surveillance team is actually a really good card, especially when you combo it with Homeland Intervention. This is an action, zero cost. You can choose up to three shield cards you control and choose a scheme. Then remove two threat from that scheme for each card exhausted this way. So you can keep your surveillance teams around, around like save counters for them or thwart with allies to save consequential damage. And suddenly you have a lot of control over the villain. Agent 13 is really fun because after Agent 13 attacks or thwarts, you get to choose a shield support and ready that support. One of the best choices is going to be the Helicarrier, which you have in the core set. Uh, so you play Agent 13. You, so let's say you pay for Agent 13 using the um, Helicarrier. She comes into play, thwarts two, you get to ready her again. Or not ready her, you get to ready the Helicarrier again and then play another card for a reduced cost. Or you could also ready someone else's Helicarrier if you're playing multiplayer. All of a sudden, your shield cards from the core set get a lot better. And you have a second archetype that you already have complete basically what i would do here is take uh nick fury and mockingbird from your core set add it into miles's shield deck that he comes with and then take spider-man peter parker out of uh the miles deck give it to ghost spider because ghost spider has all the other um web warriors and then play it cut any cards that you don't find yourself using and then suddenly you have very strong decks that can handle the campaign even you, you'll be able to handle the entire box with little difficulty compared to the other campaigns, and you can even maybe dabble an expert with just this box in the core box, which is something that's not the case for the other campaigns. And then poor Peter Parker. The, uh, the Web Warriors just came out, but unfortunately, Peter is just an Avenger. So for your next purchase, if you're going this Web Warrior track, I would recommend Spider-Ham, because Spider-Ham comes with Warrior of the Great Web, which says you can attach to a character with Spider in its title, meaning Spider-Woman and Spider-Man, and then they get the Web Warrior trait. They also get an effect, though, when a Web Warrior ally uh, leaves play, the attached character gets plus one, so you get a little bonus for it, too, but it's mostly just to get to the trait. And on top of that, Spider-Ham is one of the strongest heroes in the game. Uh, there's a bit of debate whether he or... Um, Doctor Strange is the strongest, and there's different arguments for both sides. Um, you can look into that if you want, but basically think of Spider-Ham and Doctor Strange as a tier above everyone else in the game. So you have that, plus the Web Warriors. You get to make Spider-Man from your core box a Web Warrior. That's a lot of value for just one box. So here's what you get. Uh, you it's, This is definitely the cheapest way to complete two archetypes. So it's just the core box, just the core box and sinister motives, and then you get Spider Ham and SPDR. You have shield complete. There's really nothing else you need to have a really functional shield deck, and then you have all the Web Warrior cards. It's incredible. A, a very very great choice to choose Web Warrior in my opinion. So now the Tinkerer build, and the reason I have the Guardians here on this is because you're gonna have to get into deck building if you wanna beat the Guardians campaign. You could go core box into Guardians, but I do not recommend that because of the difficulty problems I was mentioning in the campaign section. What I recommend is you multi-class. So get the core box, choose a different class, whether you want it to be mutant or uh, MCU or web warriors, and then just get that box, get whatever hero packs that you want and then move on to Guardians, most, the Galaxy's Most Wanted once you have the resources that at your disposal to actually deal with that campaign. So here are some pack suggestions that I would suggest if you're just looking to deck build and you're not necessarily looking to go down a certain route. 
So the Deadpool expansion is an obvious one in my opinion, opinion to get. Definitely want to get this because it comes with an entire new aspect. So here's one of the cards that's an example of that. It's a three cost event. You cannot play this card if you've played another card this phase. Action, discard your hand, draw a new hand. Essentially, you're just getting getting an extra mulligan. And this is the theme for this aspect. It's all this like metagaming stuff that lets you break the rules, but it's technically allowed because it's printed on a card. Think about like how this works with Black Panther or Iron Man, where you're like searching for certain cards in your deck. If you don't get them, you can have three copies of Mulligan in your deck, and then you'll probably have a Mulligan, if, and then you can uh, just discard your hand and really speed speed up that process. So it helps with the core box heroes and also basically any other hero you want to. And here's another example I'd like to point out. There's like a ton of cards, but these resources are very good too. So this is max one per deck. Double the number of resources this card generates if your identity has sustained less than five damage and triple it instead if you have sustained no damage. And there's three of them, one for each resource type. So suddenly you have access to triple resources. Crazy. Enables a lot of different stuff to, go, to happen. And that's not nearly everything. Uh, I think it's worth getting Deadpool, so I don't want to spoil all the cool stuff that's in his deck. I just wanted a little taste of what's in it. And then the next one I would recommend is Wasp for uh, deck building. Because Wasp comes with all these cards. Uh, the Quinn Carrier, if you're doing the Avengers strategy, get an easy way to get the Quinn Carrier, so you get the Wild Resource Generator. Um, Ironheart, the two-cost ally that lets you draw a card. Amazing, obviously, because you can play Ironheart do something, thwart or attack, and then block, and you get to draw a card. Amazing value. And then Spider-Man Miles Morales, who's one of my favorite allies in the game, and one I didn't have till way late, because I didn't do this in the order that I would recommend you do it. Um, when After Spider-Man enters play, choose thwart or attack, and Spider-Man gets plus two to the chosen power until the end of the phase. So this is an ally that can come in and attack for four, which basically takes out most minions, or thwart three, and then we'll still have another activation and a block left. That's amazing. Very versatile. Uh, highly recommend Miles. And then Power and All of Us. The, the double resource for basic. And no, think of all the expensive cards in basic that you want. Imagine you're playing Avengers. You have Helicarrier, Avengers Mansion, and Quinn Carrier. Those are expensive cards. But if you draw into the Power and All of Us, you can add two of them into your deck. Suddenly, it's not as hard to afford them. And then also it pays for Ironheart. And it almost pays for Spider-Man. It gives you a new way of playing. Also, shield is often um, often basic cards, mostly basic cards for like the supports and stuff. Like, justice and basic is pretty split. But like Nick Fury and Mockingbird are good with power in all of us. Helicarrier and Sky Destroyer are great. And Dum Dum Dugan and Agent Thirteen. It works with all those. So, uh, it also supplements um, the Web Warrior Shield uh, class that I was recommending earlier. And um, boot camp, an aggression card that um, each ally you control gets plus one attack, which that's really fun. Suddenly there's all these aggression leadership builds that are opened, which were opened up before. So that's a lot of really important cards and versatile cards just for one hero pack. Highly recommend Wasp. Here's a multi-class, the Spider Guard. So instead of going straight to the Guardians, I would recommend going to Sinister Motives, Finish off sister, Sinister Motives with Spider Ham and SPDR. So that's the entire Webware class that I was talking about. SPDR comes with Repurpose and limit, Limitless Stamina. Um, so Repurpose works really well with Rocket Raccoon, who comes in the Galaxy's Most Wanted because you can discard uh, your tech upgrades when you run out to get um, attack, support, or defense uh, equal to the chosen, equal to that cost. So Rocket has these three cost um three cost tech upgrades that are weapons that you can then discard and then get plus three attack or plus three thwart whatever you need and also rocket kind of needs help staying alive because he has only nine health and not like a lot of ways to deal with damage so protection is a very good way of going about that and can do damage as well with that card another important card is limitless stamina so this you can only play if your identity has at least 14 printed hit points and you just get to ready your hero for one cost. So a uh, great person to get with that is Drax, because Drax has 14 health and wants to attack a lot. So Limitless Stamina is going to help him with that. And uh, like Thor and Hulk also benefit a lot from Limitless Stamina, if you're thinking about doing that. And then um, Drax comes with Gamora, who 
brings uh, after Gamora attacks or thwarts, you discard from the top of your deck until you discard an event and add it to your hand. So that's a very powerful effect that you can use with characters like um, Adam Warlock or Star Lord or Rocket, basically, or uh, Group. Basically, any character has events that they really want in their deck. So then now, when you have the Web Warriors, you could take on the Guardian's box with Web Warriors if you want it. That archetype is complete. So you could do Web Warriors. You could do Captain Marvel with Justice Shield. That's one of my favorite decks. And then because you have more than just the Guardian's box, you can supplement Rocket Raccoon and Drax with and, and uh, Groot with these other cards so you're not just going straight into the guardians the next one uh here's an mcu multi-class example so get the um rise of red skull and then the mad titan's shadow and captain america doctor strange and scarlet witch like we talked about earlier and then probably add wasp in because as you saw wasp has great cards and then go to galaxy's most wanted then you'll actually have the resources to deal with it again just do not go into the Guardian's Most Wanted, or sorry, not Guardian, the Galaxy's Most Wanted blind. That's a bad choice. But then if you go in already having really strong decks, then you can take it on. So basically think about like, if you can handle any of the other campaigns on Expert, then that's about where you're gonna wanna be for getting through the standard campaign of Guardians. For the Tinker build as well, you're also gonna wanna look up decks. So there's different kinds of decks you're gonna see. This is one from Webware Fanatic. Uh, it's called Weaving Threads, and this is a combo deck. So when you, you can read the write-ups, often uh, people that post on there will talk about why the cards are in there. But what you can do is, let's say you really want to play this deck, identify the cards that you really need. So the main combo is you have Moon Girl, because Moon Girl lets you draw a lot of cards. And then you find Moon Girl with Suit Up, because you can grab you can find Moon Girl with Suit Up with an upgrade. That will help pay for Moon Girl. So you grab Clarity of Purpose as the mental resource to get more card draw out of Moon Girl. And then just find uh, what packs have those. Hall of Heroes is a fantastic resource for doing that. Um, it shows what comes out in every pack. And it was the resource I used to put this video together. Highly recommend that. Also on Marvel Card Database, you can hover over the packs required and it will tell you. But then Find, you don't have to have every pack to make a deck. You don't have to copy the decks exactly. Just find the cards you need for the combo. And in this instance, you would need Nova, SPDR, and the Age of Apocalypse. So I wouldn't recommend like going straight for uh, just one deck. I would kind of think of it like uh, get go along one of the tracks generally, or just do whatever you want to do, like get your favorite heroes, whatever it is that you are doing personally. And then if you see something where you're like, let's say you only need Nova to complete this deck, or you only need Nova and SPDR, or let's say you have Nova and SPDR and you just need Age of Apocalypse. If you're interested in getting an Age of Apocalypse anyways, then maybe get that. And then you can have access to this really strong deck that Web Warrior Fanatic made. Some things though, aren't a specific combo. So uh, this deck, Thunderstruck by Villain Theory is a storm deck. Uh, it uses boot camp that I was talking about earlier, and the idea is that you get about you get a bunch of allies out, get boot camp out, and then they have a lot of attack, and your allies basically do the damage for you. So you don't have to have a specific combo to make this work. What I would recommend to help this work out is just obviously storm because that's what the deck's for. Her thunderstorm also works like boot camp; every character gets plus one attack. So suddenly you're giving plus two to all your allies, which is why this deck is really strong. And then. These are some allies that you want. Uh, I would recommend Wolverine and Wasp again because Wasp gets you boot camp. And then Wolverine has those three allies that are in that list. So once you have just Storm, Wolverine, and Wasp, you have access to not this exact version of the deck, but something that's very close. That's something you should stay aware of. So here's my personal recommendation. I recommend the Web Warrior trait. If unless you just really aren't into Spider the Spider Universe or the Across the Spider Verse movie or whatever it is, or you like, or you just like Avengers or uh, mutants more, uh, I would recommend this because all the things I mentioned earlier, it's like complete within itself. You get this plus two packs, and then you have Web Warriors and Shield complete, and I it just feels like the most value for what you can do get out of the game to me and then after that 
go into like more of a tinkerer build or go into the MCU build. So really, this is just a guide, right? So use this as like a reference point to see uh, like ideas for what to do. But ultimately, it's up to you. Like what, once you've played the game enough, um, you'll kind of you'll, you'll be able to function without needing to follow this exactly. So you just use it as a guide. Maybe you want to do the MCU track or maybe you just want to get like just Rise of Red Skull and then whatever packs you want. Anything's fine. And that's all I had for you today. I hope this has been, will be very useful for you and that it can save you some heartache that I went through when I got everything in an order that didn't make sense. Uh, if you like this video or made it all the way to the end, uh, let me know what you think. And if you've already got a lot of things, maybe tell me how you felt about it. Um, yeah. So like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. It helps a lot. Uh, I'm not just saying that, it really helps the channel grow when you do that. And it helps me keep making the videos because like, it's a lot nicer to make videos if I'm actually getting to interact with the people that are seeing them. And that's it. So until next time, stay zesty.